I'm Sean. I'm uh, an internal grad student and a contributing member of the Monero project, which is similar to Bitcoin. Uh, Monero has been in a lot of uh, controversy recently. There's a lot of news going on. And that just happens to be the hottest coin right now because of that. Just a bunch of news came out recently. But I'm here to talk about the limits of Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin was basically the very first proof of concept. It was the first coin that we considered something successful. Uh, mathematicians had been talking about digital cash for a long time. But until Satoshi came out with this process, it had never been done before. He proved it's actually viable. Um, Satoshi proved that Bitcoin can work. But now we're left with the challenge of actually making it work right. So the first question we have right now, the first and most important challenge, is the virtue of privacy. Uh, Bitcoin started out with a form of privacy that's been degraded recently because of some uh, problems with the original design. Uh, there's a number of new technologies that have been developed in the last few years that really bring privacy back to the fore. Uh, but first, let's actually wonder and talk about why we have privacy in digital currency in the first place. The first and most obvious reason, prejudice. We're achieving greater levels of tolerance and civility, but the world can still be a harsh and dangerous place. Humanity has varied in conflicting beliefs, and many people find it difficult to interact peacefully with others they don't know or trust. Privacy and private association allows people from different backgrounds to work together without conflict and help bring about a future where openness is common rule. There's other features too, fungibility. Uh, fungibility requires that bad actors harm is limited in, in, in that no one individual can spoil the entire system for everybody else. Um, safety. Uh, digital cash can be safely stored in multiple backup systems that cannot be stolen or accessed by force. You can blow up in a safe with dynamite, but you can't blow up in a uh, blockchain. It won't happen. Uh, uh, for fairness, Bitcoin's transactions are open to everyone. Good luck trying to prevent your competitors from data mining all of your actual spending, your customer data. So it's open to everyone anytime you want to. Uh, also, with the, uh, the ongoing controversy with social media, we're being reminded recently about why we want to keep control over our own data. Individuals have control over their information, not social media companies. Well, privacy is probably the most important virtue of digital currency. So now we're going to play a couple games to actually show how we can achieve privacy through the mathematics of encryption. Uh, the current standard we have right now is what's called elliptic curve encryption. Uh, there was previously this thing called uh, prime factorization, but that's been proven to have problems. So everybody uses elliptic curves now. And uh, ECDSA is a, a term you're going to see a lot. So elliptic curve digital signal algorithms, or si elliptic curve digital signature algorithms. The best way to explain this is to imagine like a 13-hour clock. I'm sure it shows 24 up there, but we need to use a prime number. So just pretend it says 13. Um, every time you go past the number 13, you actually rotate right back to 1. So say you give me your, pri your public key of 5 and 9, and you want to be able to sign things, I might be able to figure out your private key just from that. I know that the way you sign things is that you take the number 5 and multiply it by your private key, and you come up with the number 9. That's why you see these things. So if I were to try to figure this out, I'd say, hmm, 5 times 2 is 10, but 10 isn't 9. 5 times 3 is 15, minus 13, because we rotate around, is 2, but 2 isn't 9. Uh, so I keep going through the numbers until I say 5 times 7 is 35, minus 13 is 22, minus 13 is 9. Oh, I just figured out your private key, and now I own your key pair. So I got your stuff. So for very small numbers like 13, things like that, it's actually pretty easy to solve. But we're using this, and actually that would work. Somebody could, if somebody were to give me a prime number 13, I could solve it. So how do you actually solve this? How do you have a public and private key pair that nobody could solve? Well, the ECDSA system actually uses these numbers that, well, they're pretty darn big, like intergalactically big. <laughs> a lot of these numbers are like 617 decimal digits long. So yeah, there's basically no way anybody's ever going to figure out your private key just by trying to run some back algorithm. So whenever you come up with a unique public and private key pair, you can pretty much guarantee 
it's unique in the universe. Nothing you pick will ever be picked by anybody else. Okay, there's these things called wallets, which are public-private key pair in, in times past. All right, here you go. Let's say you're gonna, you wanna make your own wallet. You make a completely random public-private key, key, key pair and call it your own wallet. It's mine, nobody else. We know that since it's completely random, nobody else has ever created this wallet before. You can't conflict with anybody else because the chances of that happening are intergalactic. It's not happening. Since nobody else has your wallet, it's not in the blockchain yet. You can't see it in the blockchain because you just created it brand new from scratch. And well, since it isn't in the blockchain yet, you default to zero coins. And you're gonna have zero coins in that, in that wallet until somebody actually gives you coins. And of course, if somebody gives you coins, you show up in the blockchain the very first time. So you can actually have a whole bunch of wallets as long as you don't put anything into them. They're unique, they're yours, and they just aren't in the blockchain yet. Um, and also kind of a thing, if you don't have to look at the blockchain until you know you got your first transaction. So the blockchain may be 100 gigs or something, but you only gotta look at the recent ones. So anyway, congratulations, you now how to know, know how to actually create a wallet that's encrypted and hides your identity. You just randomly make one up and call it your own. Monero is a project that I've been working on recently. It's very exciting because it takes that basic idea of creating a bunch of random numbers and this uses them to complete, provide complete anonymity throughout the entire system. Monero is a community-driven project, meaning there's no companies involved. There's no, you gotta pay a little bit for using the system or anything. Uh, the entire system, all the coders, all the people involved, they're given donations for their effort. Everyone's a volunteer. Uh, Monero is money in Esperanto, if, you, if that means anything. Uh, the Monero system uses a couple things that are similar to what we saw with wallets. They create these things called rig signatures. They take a bunch of old public keys that have been in the blockchain before and they say, well, I'm gonna group all these old ones that actually aren't part of my transaction. And I'm gonna put my public key there and say I'm gonna do a spend. And if this enormous amounts of public keys together, I have a way of signing and saying at least one person in here actually has a private key that said this transaction is legit. You can't tell which one, only that was one of them. And so the whole transaction goes through and you verify that somebody sent it. And you can't really see who it was who actually sent the whole thing. So you can say, well, you can have the shaggy defense. You can say, hey, it wasn't me. It was one of the other people involved. <laughs> Not me, I don't know. They picked some old thing I had. Can't, can't blame me. Uh, they also have stealth addresses, meaning that if you receive money, this, the address you have is not the public and private key pair you had previously. It's a brand new one that nobody can ever guess. So you can never prove that you ever received anything. And also too, this is kind of funny how they did this. There's this thing called ring CTs, ring confidential transactions. You can prove that you, you hide the amount of money that was actually sent in the transaction, but you can, you can prove that the debits are equal to credits by this cool math. It's actually nice, but um, this, is, this is considered the best privacy coin right now because nobody's ever been able to really beat the system. There's this other system in place though. It's based on what's called zero knowledge proofs, which is brand new. It's actually kind of fun. I'm gonna play a coin game with you right now. Let's say you choose a side of a coin, a heads or tails. You choose one, but you don't tell me what it is. And I don't know what it is. I just, you kind of give it to me, I keep it behind my back. And I wanna prove that you know which one it is, even though I don't know. So I'm gonna, behind my back, decide whether I'm gonna flip the coin or not and show it to you. Is this the side you picked? Did I flip it? And you say, yes, you flipped it, or no, you didn't. Then you decide randomly to flip or not flip. If you're a faker, somebody who's trying to pretend like you made the decision, but it wasn't actually you, you have a 50-50% chance of getting it right every time. If you're the original person, of course, you'll get it right every single time. But if I keep challenging you, is that, did I do it? Did I do it? After a long enough period of time, I'll realize, now either you actually are the legit person who made this decision, or you're just a faker who got really freaking lucky. So at that point, I just declare the fact that, okay, you're legitimate. You, ver you actually did make a verified decision, but I don't know what your decision was. So I can verify the truth of this claim without knowing what it was. Hmm. We can even extend this exact same situation to uh, say voting decisions. I don't know who you voted for, but I guarantee you actually legitimately voted for a candidate and it counts. And I can even do aggregates like total amount of votes went to this or that with no way of me actually knowing what, what individuals did. And even deeply personal information. Like, there's always questions at blood banks and things like that. That could be completely kept private. No one could ever actually violate the privacy. We, and there's even a way of doing this where you can call, you create what's called a ZK snark, where there's a secret password that you agree to beforehand. And the entire system works perfectly fine. That's what we bring to Zcash, which is based on this. 
Now, Zcash is uh, different than Monero in that this is a corporation that ran the whole thing. They basically created ZK Snarks, where it hides your sender, your recipient, and your amount using the same system we just discussed. There's basically no way around that. Now, this, uh, one of the major problems is that privacy isn't defaulted. So whenever you choose to have your ZK Snarks hidden information, it sticks out a little bit. Most people, uh, most people don't go for the privacy because you have to pay a little bit more in your fees. Whereas when you go for a transparent transaction, it just goes real, through real quick. But uh, it's interesting because if you choose, you basically have no way of anybody knowing anything about your transactions. Uh, and there's this third coin that's popular too. It's called Dash, which is it's self-funded by a, a DAO. Um, and the miners contribute a small portion of the mined cur uh, currency right back to the DAO. Um, it's kind of a midpoint between the two coins. They use this other system called CoinJoin, where you can make plausible deniability because everybody joins a big ring on sends. It's not as cool as the other ones, but it still works. And most people, because it's not privacy defaulted, they just choose for the, the cheap transparent transactions. Privacy exists. We know that digital cash can be held with near complete privacy. But that doesn't mean that there's unlimited irresponsibility. Uh, the real world has bad actors, people who promote their own interests over societies. And the same methods that can be used to protect the innocent can be used to protect the guilty. The future of enforcement for the legal system will require more diligence and intelligence by society's protectors. Yet the very same people who work to protect the innocent through these systems will usually are the same people who work to actually stop the guilty and people prevent people from abusing these. And this is, this is an ongoing debate about freedom versus safety. It's uh, still an open question.